You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Wednesday the 19th of February 2014. Asylum seeker murdered wife because she wanted divorce. A 155% rise in children groomed by sex gangs. Police identified 450 potential victims during 2013. Labour, NCCL and PIE. Channel S boss Mohamed Ferdas jailed over crash for cash insurance scam. Norway's child minister backs insane care threat. Expelled Muslims should get citizenship too. Nigeria's Boko Haram in a village massacre. Thought for the day, is there a need for the BNP? And finally, a two-for-one day. UK News. Asylum seeker murdered wife because she wanted divorce. A failed asylum seeker murdered his wife after she threatened a divorce that might have forced him to leave the UK, a court heard. Fahad Safi, 23, an Afghan national, appeared at the Old Bailey today charged with stabbing wife Orina Morowich, 21, multiple times in the neck and chest. Orina was found dead in the flat that the couple shared at East Down Park Lee on the 21st of August last year, after her mother reported her missing. Police also found a bloody knife in the kitchen sink, bloodstains in the bathroom and Safi's discarded clothes. Safi fled the scene but was later arrested in Dover and charged two days later. The jury heard how the couple met at Lewisham College where she studied tourism and administration. When they married in 2012, Arena wore a headscarf and pledged to convert to Islam. Prosecutor Zoe Johnson QC said the relationship disintegrated when they argued about her wearing makeup and Muslim dress and she was forced to see her friends in secret. By the time of the murder, Arena had been seeking a divorce. Johnson told the jury if Arena had divorced the defendant, he would have had to leave this country or apply in his own right for leave to remain. The prosecution suggests this may be a reason why the defendant became angry with his wife and killed her. Safi had been denied asylum in the UK, but after the wedding, he was allowed to stay in the country as the spouse of a European national. In a statement given to police, Safi blamed a Peckham gang for the murder. World at eight. Deportation back to Afghanistan and probable freedom for him, it is the Muslim way. Anything to get him out of this country works for me. Preferably with a shot of plague to take with him, of course. 155% rise in children groomed by sex gangs. Police identified 450 potential victims during 2013. Rebecca Camber, crime reporter for the Daily Mail, wrote, The rise recorded by National Crime Agency could be down to better awareness though the number of trafficking and domestic slavery cases have also shot up. Better awareness of what? This article was buried on page 19 of Tuesday's Daily Mail and was attracting attention on the Mail Online. Today, Wednesday the 19th of February 2014, it's disappeared from all sites except the search engines. What don't they want us to know? Russia Today still carries their article on the National Crime Agency's report stating that UK child sex trafficking soars. The Guardian still carries a number of UK-born children being trafficked for sexual abuse soars. And BBC still has UK child sex abuse trafficking doubles, National Crime Agency. So come on, Daily Mail, what is going on? World at eight. I think we all know, don't we? Along with that ITV programme on the police, they showed a Muslim Asian officer who had done 20 years on the streets of guess where? Only Rochdale. So how come he wasn't enough in touch with his community to stop the Muslim sex groomings going on under his nose for the last 30 odd years? ITV didn't hit on that point at all. Labour, NCCL and PIE. The Daily Mail says the full extent of the shocking links between three senior Labour figures and a vile group that tried to legalise sex with children can be exposed today. Bloody hell, the British National Party and World Aid have been reporting this home truth for many years and the Mail says it can expose the truth today. Now they have the cheek to publish. How three of the party's most senior figures campaigned for a vile paedophile group now being probed by police for abusing children on an industrial scale. Documents found by mail show link between left-wing and paedophiles, 
Harriet Harman, Jack Dromey and Patricia Hewitt held senior positions at National Council for Civil Liberties before rising to top of the Labour Party. The NCCL was an affiliate of the Paedophile Information Exchange, PIE, whose members may have abused children on an industrial scale. Paperwork reveals NCCL helped lobby Parliament for the age of sexual consent to be cut to as low as 10 and called for incest to be legalised. Channel S boss Mohamed Ferhas jailed over crash for cash insurance scam. The founder of Britain's biggest Bangladeshi television station has been jailed for three years for laundering profits from a 1.9 million crash for cash insurance scam. Channel S boss Mohamed Ferhas 40 of Little Worley Hall Lane, Brentwood, helped flush funds generated by a team of fraudsters led by his brother, Mohamed Samsul Haq, 26. He was sentenced at Southwark Crown Court today after earlier admitting possessing criminal property. Hack, along with five other men, had already been sentenced to a total of more than 12 years in prison after the court previously heard more than 120 bogus claims for luxury cars were engineered through his company, Motor Alliance. Cars were trashed at crash for cash drinking parties at Hack's garage in Tottenham, North London. The gang ran the vehicles into each other, blocking out the noise with blaring music, before finishing the job with baseball bats. And between November 2005 and October 2008, a series of London-based accident management firms were used as a front to hide the activities. The firm raked in around £1.17 million in profits from the scam, which was busted after police raided Motor Alliance and unearthed 64 files relating to insurance claims in the boot of a silver Mercedes. World at Eight Surely the establishment can see what they are importing and encouraging in this country now. We have always had enough of our own criminals without taking in flotsam from the East. And as we have always said at World at Eight, it is always a family affair. European News Norway's child minister backs insane care threat. Norway's children's minister has backed a proposal to withhold benefits from immigrant parents who fail to teach their children Norwegian and in extreme cases even deprive them of custody. The measures were part of proposals for a new integration agency launched on Monday by Carl Hagen, the former leader of the Progress Party for Oslo Municipality. There are many good suggestions here, Selvig Horn, Minister of Children, Equality and Social Inclusion, told Norway's NRK Channel. It should be up to each municipality, but I think Oslo's Progress Party is making important contributions to the integration debate. I shall take this with me in future work. Marianne Martinson, who represents the Oslo Labour Party in the Norwegian Parliament, described the proposals as absolutely insane. But Horn appeared to have no problems with the most controversial suggestion, taking children into care if their parents fail to teach them Norwegian. I am very happy for children to go into care if there is neglect, she said. Every parent has a responsibility to ensure that children can speak Norwegian by the time they start school. Asked whether failing to teach children language constituted neglect, Horn was a little evasive. This is something the Child Welfare Agency must consider in individual cases. But being able to speak the language before starting school is very important and all parents must ensure that their children can. NRK's political commentator Lars Nehru Sand argued that both Hagen's radical proposals and Horn's response to them were a political trick to keep the party's more radical anti-immigrant supporters on side without alienating the majority in Norway. The party is still resorting to the tried and tested, well-known and occasionally well-functioning political trick of double communication, he said. They might get a hearing at the Progress Party's National Congress, but these proposals will never be adopted as policy in Oslo, in the government or by parliament, he added. He said progress time and time again has had one of its more radical elements, per Sandberg, Christian Tybring Jed, or this week Carl Hagen, make radical far-right proposals. A more moderate figure than nuances the message, rephrasing it in a way more acceptable to the majority, without rejecting it outright, as Horn did on Tuesday. This tells other voter groups that you can still count on us, we are still here for you, he argued. World date. I can go along with the lack of the Norwegian language, but taking into care means that these immigrant parents will get all their progeny looked after while they can either work or leave the country. It would leave a massive amount of foreign children in European care, and this would cost the Norwegians dear. Deportation if they don't integrate is the answer, and I mean integrate with a capital I. Expelled Muslims should get citizenship too. 
Descendants of Muslims who were kicked out of Spain in the 17th century have criticised the Spanish government for only granting citizenship to the country's former Jewish population, saying the move could be racist. Moriscos, meaning Moors in English, was the name given to the Spanish Muslims who decided to convert to Christianity to avoid expulsion under monarchs Elizabeth, Isabella and Ferdinand in the early 1500s. Although they were allowed to remain in Spain for over a century longer than their Jewish counterparts, King Philip III decreed the expulsion of the Moriscos in 1609, forcing them all to flee to neighbouring Muslim North Africa. Now that Spain's justice ministry has decided to grant citizenship to the descendants of the Sephardi Jews who were kicked out 522 years ago, associations fighting to keep the memory of Muslim Spain alive are calling for the same civil code changes for the Moriscos. The Spanish state should grant the same rights to all those who were expelled, otherwise their decision is selective if not racist. Bayou Lubar is president of the Association for Historical Legacy of Al-Andalus, told Spanish news agency EFE. Lubar still believes the ruling granting citizenship to Spain's Sephardi Jews is very positive, arguing it acts as acknowledgement of the guilt of the Spanish state in expelling its own citizens. Even though the descendants of Spain's Moriscos have less chance of obtaining dual nationality than Sephardi Jews, Lubaris' association is primarily focused on obtaining recognition for what happened to Spain's Muslim population and how they left their mark on Spanish culture. This can be seen in physical form with the Grand Mosque of Cordoba and the Alhambra Palace of Granada. Their legacy is predominantly alive in the northern Moroccan cities of Fez, Rabat and Tetan, where they became city aristocrats and occupied positions of power. Although the approximately 300,000 Morisco descendants in North Africa no longer speak Castilian Spain, they took with them the architecture, gastronomy and music, which typifies Andalusia to this day. World at eight. OK, OK. But first we have to acknowledge that the Moors of the Middle Ages are nothing like the present-day Muslims in the realms of culture or learning. Spain should learn a lesson from Ferdinand and Isabella. Spain for the Spanish. It is, after all, what the government are now doing with the British in Spain, virtually making life so difficult and taxes so high, they're having to come home. So citizenship, a very bad idea for any Muslim, ex or otherwise, keep them in Morocco. Spain is too near France and France is too near England for my liking. World News. Nigeria's Boko Haram in village massacre. Suspected Islamist militants have raided a Nigerian village and murdered dozens, according to witnesses. The gunman reportedly rounded up a group of men in Izki village and shot them before going door to door and killing anyone they found. Officials said they suspected the Boko Haram group was behind the attack. Boko Haram, which claims to be fighting to create an Islamic state in northern Nigeria, is notorious for extreme violence and indiscriminate attacks. The senator for Borno State, where the attack took place, told the BBC's Newsday programme that 106 people, 105 men and an elderly woman trying to protect her grandson were killed in the latest attack. Ali Nadume said around 100 Islamist militants attacked Izge for about five hours on Saturday evening without any intervention from the army. He said the military recently withdrew from the area after nine soldiers were killed in an ambush last week. World date. And we want these self-same tribes in Europe. Thought for the day, is there a need for the BNP? Well, of course there is. However, I truly believe that if the Conservative Party hadn't mucked itself around since the last war and had stayed true to its English heritage, there'd be no need for what is laughingly called the far right. Although I'm not ashamed to be called the far right, as indeed I personally am, the British National Party is a socialist party with old Labour roots. And for anyone's information, if the Labour Party had stayed true to its old members and supporters, lived like they had, and were not, for the most part nowadays, educated well above their original stations in life, that would be a better party now. There'd be no need for a party like us, even though we are not guided by the amount of money the unions bring in, or the huge amounts of corporate monies and private investors' bribes to keep them out of the flack. So, no, there would not if your aunt had balls, so to speak. But in this case, in the here and now, yes, England does need the British National Party. Toxic, though I can better to scream through identical mail shoved through our members' post boxes. What you have to think of is what was the first movement to touch on immigration. I believe it was the old National Front, a goodly portion of which became the present British National Party. Now, I will touch on immigration later today, but would say that this word immigration 
has been adopted in part and badly by the so-called three large political parties in the UK, pre-Euro election and general. Of course, in the true spirit of political fellowship, we are not given any credence for this whatsoever. But what do you expect from a pig but a grunt? Our splinter competitors rant on about the same subject we have been ranting on about for many years, and truly they must think the English public well stupid if they can't spot that. But immigration is a touchy subject for everyone, even immigrants. Let's face it, immigration is, despite the BBC's media push to make us all immigrants from the year dot, a new genocidal invasion on a massive scale. No other country in the world per capita has had such a diverse selection of newcomers during the last 50 years. And I hear the reasons why our party is seen as racist. It is because it is an unfortunate fact of life that when a subject as difficult as immigration comes up, there is always a community of older, more integrated immigrants to consider. And they must be considered. One cannot tar all with the same brush in certain cases, if you will excuse the expression. And one must also not view immigration as a plus for the indigenous lazy of this country. I love Chinese and Indian food, but I don't want to see whole towns and cities overrun with Chinese and Indians. No. I like the West Indians. Well, the chalkies of the world, anyway. Laid back, colourful and generally well integrated. Well, with white girls, anyway. But would I want my country to look like a shanty town in Jamaica? No. Africans, well, taking the general line, they don't integrate well, and although their culture and dress is colourful to see, would you want your country to look, smell and act like the average African village? No. Islam, and I'm having to make it religion here, because, as we all know, Islam takes in anyone from anywhere, as long as they adhere to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, PBUH, I suppose. But despite having some admirable qualities, the hatred and resentment the average Muslim carries around with him against non-believers or kafirs, even in their own country, makes him an uneasy guest in any country, including ours. Do we want to see more mosques or Muslim communities? No. Nepalese, Filipino and other various ethnicities, too many to go into at this stage. The Filipinos have taken over the NHS and have taken all the white blue collar jobs in the hospitals. In my short stay yesterday in a surgical ward under the NHS, I can only say that my treatment was very good. My surgeon was white as were the theatre nurses. The anaesthetist was a lovely Indian doctor who treated me just fine. The Filipino trolley dolly who wheeled me in was a cheerful chappy. The recovery nurse was white, but the Nepalese nurses on the ward did lack a certain charm and humour. My charm offensive was running out before I went down and was in reception. A Chinese trio came in, one man and two women, one of which was hugely pregnant. I listened and noticed that they had cancelled one of the women's operations that day by mistake, obviously not understanding the cancellation letter at the back of the admission letter and sending that back. For one reason or another, they rebooked them in front of everyone else waiting, even though they should have rebooked for a later date and she went sailing off with a fellow ethnic to have her op. I was rather angry, but of course kept quiet, even when I was told that there was no bed for me at that time and I would have to wait. However, that problem was solved. In and out, marvellous, didn't feel a thing. My hat off to our NHS, and long may it survive after the last illegal has left this country. But one can understand the resentment when the average Brit, who has paid into this system for many years, and may be approaching a non-viable age to be overlooked for strangers who have never paid in to any form of health care in this country. One might think this and other pea-takers are taking the race and immigration scam just a bit too far. I don't love my fellow tribes that much on occasion, let alone a sodding bunch of Chinese takeaway owners, one of which was hugely preggy with yet another migrant. Poles, Russians and Eastern Europeans. Hmm. Well, this lot get it in the press and on the BBC, but apart from a selection of Muslim Europeans and Romas, most of these people look like us. Which is rather unfortunate, as you might look around a large town and see the usual three-quarters black, brown, yellow faces, and then the shining light of a couple of white faces with a pushchair and wallop. They don't speak it English at all. One might say that with the EU we are compelled to take anyone from a member country, but what has to be remembered by you out there is that whatever ethnicity or colour you are, if you come from a country in the EU, there is no stopping you. And this has compounded the problem of immigration over the last 30 years at least.
Now, there's a part of a well-known email going round written by a black Namibian citizen, Pashu Shudi, in the Namibian Sun on Thursday, March 24, 2011. My guess is that, had the following been written by a white journalist, he would have been sacked from the newspaper. I quote, Although hard to swallow, us black people despise everything that looks like us. To prove my point not long ago, fellow blacks who had run away from atrocities in their own African countries were beaten, burned and sometimes even killed by fellow blacks in South Africa. In Namibia, black supporters of the ruling party Swapo and the opposition parties clashed in 2009 and we still hear of such quarrels or violence just in the name of politics. Through studying history, I've come to learn that we actually disliked one another before colonialism, hence fierce tribal fights during those years. Colonialism united us all in the fight against a common enemy, and after colonialism we saw the rebirth of things we thought were buried a long time ago, like tribalism, regionalism, favouritism, etc. Although we do not like others from other tribes, we love all things we do not produce. We love fine brandy clothes from Europe. We love American and German-made cars. We love expensive wines and whiskies. yet no African person brews any of them. All we own, unfortunately, are thousands of shabims where we drink ourselves to death, stab each other with knives and bottles, infect each other with HIV virus, make lots of unwanted babies and then blame others for our miseries. We love all sorts of expensive foreign-made items and show them off, yet we look down on our own indigenous products that we fail to commercialise. As blacks, we know very little about investments, whether in stocks or in properties. All we know is how to invest our money in things that depreciate or evaporate fastest like clothes, cars, alcohol and, when we're at it, we want the whole world to see us. I know some brothers driving BMWs, yet they sleep on the floors and don't have beds because nobody will see them anyway. This is what we love doing and this is the black life, a life of showing off for those who have. A millionaire tenderpreneur living in Lugwichdorf or Kleinkup in Windhoek will drive to the notorious Everline Street in Katatura where he will show off his expensive car and look down on others. We sell our natural resources to Europe for processing and then buy them back in finished products. What makes us so inferior in our thinking that we only pride ourselves when we have something made by others? Our leaders scream at us how bad the Europeans are, yet they steal our public money and hide it in European banks. We know how Europeans ransacked Africa, but we are scandalously quiet when our own leaders loot our countries and run with briefcases under their arms, full of our riches, to Europe. The Europeans took our riches to Europe, but our African leaders are doing this too. Why do our African leaders who claim to love us run to invest their money in Europe? Again, when they get sick, they're quick to be flown to Europe for treatment, yet our relatives die in hospital queues. Don't our leaders trust the health systems they have created for us all? Why are we so subservient, so obedient to corruption, when committed by our very own people? How long are we going to blame the whites for our own inability to rise above ourselves and our situation? Waiting for stuff to be given to us for free? Hands held out for arms to cross our palms? And sadly, at the next election, we vote ourselves right back into the same state of affairs. Do you notice a similarity to us in the UK? I do. Now, this is why we need all immigration to stop. This is why we need to deport all illegals. Note, illegals, for the hard of hearing and the mixed races and the older West Indians and Indians amongst us, illegals. Listen to the English. We need to deport foreign criminals before sentencing. Why should the British public pay for these monsters to be fed and watered better than our old, old age pensioners? Their newfound families should be with them as well, then they would have their right to family life, EU obligation. We need to legally halt halal and kosher killings and make the people in the customs and excise work for their money in stopping at the borders all forms of imported meats, animals live or dead and all produce from them. And with regard to British jobs for British people, this means English, Welsh, Scottish or Irish peoples, not Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Indian, Iraqi, Kurd, Somali, Kenyan, Nepalese, Filipino, Chinese, Egyptian and whatever else the hell crawls over to this green and pleasant land that was. Greedy employers note. The reduction of already large settlements in the north of this country of Muslim ghettos is paramount and the closing down of mosques will be mandatory or perhaps turning them into wine bars like our churches have been, is preferable. 
That means in a perfect world, if this comes to pass, that us Brits will have to make sure our children are educated up to standard and our state schools are not just a means of foreign children getting a free education which will enable them to take jobs from our children. Now they just come off the banana boats unchecked and unmonitored and take them anyway. That is why the average Brit does not like immigration, because now it is similar to the lapping of the flood waters at their own doors, so to speak. Tough though it is, it might be up to us, the BNP, to make sure that England recaptures some of its glory and asserts itself in a civilised method to show the world and Europe that we can take back our culture and country without resorting to the methods that we, as a nationalist party, are supposed to do. Only then, with a blocked immigration system in place, can we, or any government or people, truly ascertain the damage done to our infrastructure, both socially and politically. It would leave the true British people a leaner, fitter country on which to build, and it would leave the older, more integrated immigrants in place. If you've lived here for years, worked and contributed and integrated into the English community, then you are entitled to stay. If, however, you've arrived in the last 30 years, or your parents did, they have not contributed to the country in any way, brought more of your kind in regardless, do not speak English or pursue an English way of life, have ghettoised themselves, their businesses and their properties, regard the UK as a cash cow for themselves to own and live in homes abroad, operate any form of criminal activities from drug running to sexual grooming or worse, then the whole clan should be sent home, with their money, of course. There is so much that can be done, which is why you need the British National Party. There was a picture with the article by Pashu Shudu, and it showed Rome, 2000 BC, with a beautiful temple, with columns, tiling and gardens. And then 2000 AD, showing a run-down African village. Need I say more? Am I a racist or a realist? You tell me. And finally, a two-for-one day. A young woman walked into a supermarket and on her way around she saw the young man to whom she had surrendered her affections the previous evening after they'd met in a pub. He was stacking washing powder boxes on the shelves. You lying toad, she shouted. Last night you told me you were a stunt pilot. No, he said, I told you I was a member of the aerial display team. And to complete your day, two women were out for a Saturday stroll. One had a Doberman and the other a Chihuahua. As they walked down the street, the one with the Doberman said to her friend, let's go over to that bar for a drink. The lady with the Chihuahua said, I, we can't go in there, we've got dogs with us. The one with the Doberman said, just watch and do as I do. They walked over to the bar and the one with the Doberman put on a pair of dark glasses and started to walk in. The bouncer at the door said, sorry lady, no pets allowed. The woman with the Doberman said, you don't understand, this is my seeing eye dog. The bouncer said, a Doberman? The woman said, yes, they're using them now, they're very good. The bouncer said, OK, come on in. The lady with the chihuahua thought that convincing him that a chihuahua was a seeing-eye dog may be a bit more difficult, but thought, what the heck? So she put on her dark glasses and started to walk in. Once again, the bouncer said, sorry, lady, no pets allowed. The woman said, you don't understand, this is my seeing-eye dog. The bouncer said, a chihuahua? The woman with the chihuahua said, a chihuahua? They gave me a fucking chihuahua? You have been listening to The World Date. I'm Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good and a very dry night.